Laura. I will go ahead and get us started. Welcome everyone to the 46th Triennial Council of the Phi Beta Kappa Society. Uh, my name is Eva Caldera and I'm the Associate Secretary and Chief Operating Officer of the Society. And on beca behalf of Phi Beta Kappa's leadership and staff, I am so pleased to be able to kick off this conference with the first of three sessions that will immerse you in the excitement of the liberal arts and sciences today. Before I begin, I also want to thank Phi Beta Kappa Senator Jean Howard and my colleague, Anne Tria Wise, who is director of our National Arts and Sciences Initiative, for their important roles in helping to plan this wonderful panel. We are lucky enough to have gathered for you this afternoon a panel of four fantastic scholars of William Shakespeare, the 16th century playwright whose work remains the most widely produced of any playwright in America. Delving into the richness and complexity of Shakespeare's plays and their reception over more than 400 years, each of our panelists is asking new questions and cultivating new insights into the human condition that resonate in our times. Each is doing cutting edge research, reaching the next generation of students and engaging broad communities, aiming to inspire both reflection and action. In our invitation to them, we let them know that this would be an audience of passionate advocates for the liberal arts, eager to kick off the 2021 triennial with a true Phi Beta Kappa experience, one that celebrates the life of the mind and demonstrates the power of the arts and sciences to grapple with the grand challenges now facing our society and our world. So we can get right to what they have to say. I will keep my introductions brief. You can read more about these remarkable scholars in the online meeting platform. And after introductions, I'll invite each of them to share for about five minutes. Next, we'll go into a group conversation mode with me posing questions and inviting reflections on our themes. And because our time is short, and we have more great sessions ahead today, we won't be able to have the panel take audience questions, but we do encourage all of you to engage with each other and share resources and exchange ideas using the chat function, which we will um, happily and with interest read later So and share with the panelists. Um, I'm now delighted to begin with introductions of our panel. First, Dr. Catherine Steele Brokaw, is Associate Professor of English at University of California, Merced. She has published multiple articles, reviews, and award-winning monograph, and has a new books in, book in the works entitled Shakespeare and Community Performance in Practice. She is co-founding artistic director of Shakespeare in Yosemite, which offers free annual Shakespearean performances in Yosemite National Park to celebrate Earth Day. She is also the co-founder of the Earth Shakes Alliance, a recently established global collective of Shakespearean theaters, companies, and individuals pledging to put environmental concerns at the heart of their practices and productions. Welcome, Dr. Brokaw. Next, Dr. Ruben Espinosa is Associate Professor of English at Arizona State University and Associate Director of the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies. His research examines issues of race, language, ethnic identity, assimilation, and immigration at the intersection of Shakespeare studies and Latinx studies. Dr. Espinosa is the author of Shakespeare on the Shades of Racism, as well as Masculinity and Marian Efficacy in Shakespeare's England. He is co-editor of Shakespeare and Immigration. 2014, he has served as trustee of the Shakespeare Association of America and currently serves on the editorial board of Shakespeare Quarterly. He is at work on a new book entitled Shakespeare on the Border, Language, Legitimacy, and La Frontera. Welcome, Dr. Espinosa. Next, Dr. Scott Newstock. He is a professor of English and founding director of the Pierce Shakespeare Endowment at Rhodes College. An award-winning teacher and widely published scholar, Dr. Newstock is most recently the author of How to Think Like Shakespeare, which was named a 2020 Book of the Year by the Times Literary Supplement. A committed undergraduate teacher, Dr. Newstock has taught students in many venues besides Rhodes College, through grade school tutoring, junior high mentoring, high school lectures, teacher workshops, prison seminars, and adult education courses. 
Among the many organizations that have benefited from his leadership are Opera Memphis, Humanities Tennessee, and importantly for us, the Phi Beta Kappa chapter at Rhodes College. Welcome, Dr. Newstock. Finally, Dr. Ayanna Thompson, an internationally recognized scholar of Shakespeare, race, and performance. Dr. Thompson is Regents Professor of English at Arizona State and the director of the Arizona State Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies. She is the author of many articles and books, including Passing Strange, Shakespeare, Race, and Contemporary America, and her most recent book, Blackface, which explores the history and legacy of the performance of Blackness from pre-modern stages to contemporary media. Dr. Thompson serves on the Board of Trustees of the Royal Shakespeare Theater, and she is a Shakespeare scholar in residence at the Public Theater in New York City. This past April, she was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. We are especially grateful to her for her service to Phi Beta Kappa as a visiting scholar in 2017 and 2018. Welcome, Professor Thompson. So now you know who we're gonna be listening to and I'm going to invite each of the panelists to offer about five minutes or so of reflections on their work and on the question at hand. How do you find yourself today drawing on some aspect of Shakespeare's work to help illuminate the grand challenges that we're facing? And what we'll do is we'll go in alphabetical order, the same order as I introduced our guests in. So that means we're beginning with Dr. Katie Brokaw. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. It is um, a real honor to be here among you all. Climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss disproportionately affect the people who are least responsible for creating these ecological catastrophes. Where I teach at the University of California Merced, such environmental injustice is keenly felt. 90% of our students are people of color, many coming from pesticide exposed farm worker families and growing up in heavily contaminated areas. Our campus is located in California's Central Valley, plagued by the United States' worst air quality and extreme heat, but also within a two hour drive of Yosemite National Park. As a teacher of Shakespeare in this context, my scholarly and pedagogical work has increasingly focused on the question of how adaptations of Shakespeare might address issues of environmental justice. In 2017, Paul Prescott and I co-founded Shakespeare in Yosemite, sponsored by UC Merced. We perform in the park each April for Earth Day and Shakespeare's birthday, presenting shows that are site-specific and ecologically inflected in collaboration with the National Park Service. In all of our productions, we collaborate with students, a few professional actors, park staff, scientists, and community members to create, perform, and evaluate our shows. So we usually have about a thousand people see them over the course of a weekend, and audience men members are a combination of people who come to the park, especially for the performance, and those who just stumble upon the venue when they're walking in the woods hiking. Every production is 90 minutes long. We aim for accessible, engaging, and informal. They're full of live music and heavily adapted to highlight a particular ecological issue from overconsumption and garbage in Midsummer Night's Dream to the ecological importance of trees and the danger of forest fires in As You Like It. Instead of a final dance, our productions tend to end in a musical climate march, urging collective action. This spring and summer, we're working on a feature length film, Imogen in the Wild. It was shot in Yosemite and Merced and will be released on YouTube in October. It is particularly focused on issues of environmental justice and the links between land abuse and misogyny. A team of 30 some UC Merced students are um, in the film and working behind the scenes. They're composing original music, film editing, designing, and creating curriculum packets for high schools and universities who want to teach the film. Imogen in the Wild is based on Shakespeare's play Cymbeline, and we're one of 10 theaters from around the world 
taking part in the global Cymbeline and the Anthropocene project funded by the Canadian government. Related to this work, this spring I co-organized the online Globe for Globe Shakespeare and the Climate Emergency Conference hosted by London's Globe Theatre. At that event, we launched the Earth Shakes Alliance, which is a global collective of theaters and individuals who pledge to put environmental concerns at the heart of their theater making, teaching, or scholarship. Our website contains scholarly and theatrical resources, including all of the Globe for Globe presentation recordings. So the idea is to share ideas and best practices across borders of all kinds. I think that we can see Shakespeare as a renewable cultural resource. Unlike fossil fuels or animal species, Shakespearean texts are inexhaustible and invulnerable. We can adapt them infinitely to talk about the most pressing, pressing issue facing human civilization, our very survival. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Now we'll invite uh, Ruben Espinosa to uh, say a few words next. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm honored to be participating in this event alongside such distinguished panelists and, and really just genuinely uh, cool people. So thank you for having me today. Um, so my experience living on the US-Mexico border has allowed me to recognize the distinct set of tensions and modes of self-understanding that inform the way Chicanx students apprehend Shakespeare and indeed literary studies more broadly. Um, it's the ethos of this borderland conflict that has for the past several years guided my thinking, my teaching and my research. Um, it was my 2016 Shakespeare quarterly essay, Stranger Shakespeare, that set the stage for my research agenda. In that essay, I addressed the lacuna in Shakespeare studies when it comes to Latinx intersections with and the understandings of Shakespeare. And since then, my work has been devoted to putting Shakespeare in a conversation with present day events and cultural products surrounding topics of race, ethnicity, xenophobia, immigration, asylum, assimilation, linguistic identity, citizenship, legitimacy, and nationalism as a means of illuminating Shakespeare's cultural and literary significance to a Latinx audience in particular. To get there, I draw on literary, journalistic, filmic, dramatic, musical, and varied forms of contemporary cultural artifacts that speak to the vulnerability of black and brown people. This approach has been fruitful in allowing me to see not what Shakespeare has to teach us, but rather to see how we can enrich the field of Shakespeare studies from interdisciplinary standpoints. Most recently, I published my book, Shakespeare on the Shades of Racism, and I am now devoting my energies to my monograph in progress Shakespeare on the Border, Language, Legitimacy, and La Frontera. These works are cross historical in nature and in distinct ways they consider what John Marquez describes as the shared experiences of expendability for Blacks and Latinxes, experiences that open the door to a model of praxis and solidarity. The promise behind such solidarity opens a critical space to dislocate Shakespeare's presumed place in the United States and to imagine his cultural relevance anew. What does such dislocation mean though? Why should there be a shift in the way we think about his cultural relevance? My candid answer to these questions is that Shakespeare's value is much too often tethered to his whiteness. That is to the belief that his whiteness makes him the property of white audiences, white actors, white readers, white scholars, and not surprisingly in our present moment, white supremacists. Given pressures of assimilation, pervasive narratives that vilify Blacks and Latinxes, consistent whitewashing in Hollywood, and the dominance of whiteness in popular culture, it's hardly surprising that Latinxes in particular often imagine their legitimacy only when they approximate whiteness. Through this paradigm, Latinxes eschew the possibility of creating a community of resistance to oppressive structures that devalue their worth. And this not only broadens the critical divide between Black and Brown, but magnifies at every turn the unbearable weight of alienation. The emotional, psychological, and indeed physical toll that results from such oppressive structures is what James Baldwin identified.
I'm coming off of mute just to say that um, uh, Professor Espinosa, you're frozen. So we're going to have to pause. I apologize to you and to the audience. Maybe there's a tech support person who's going to take a look at this. Nope, it looks like we lost Professor Espinosa. Um, let's see, I guess that's the perils of having an online meeting. I'm sure he'll come back in. Um, and he was in the middle of a very profound discussion. So I, I don't know how he picks up that thread again, but um, let's give him just one minute and then maybe we'll move on if it doesn't look like it's gonna be possible for him to rejoin right away. All right. Well, I'm sure he will do his best to come back in. And um, I think that what makes the most sense is probably to go ahead and invite the next speaker to, and he'll realize what's happened, hopefully, and we'll communicate with him. Um, so, so Professor Newstock, are you ready to uh, take up the opportunity to speak to us about your thinking? That would be great. Sure, I can jump in and I can I can give a word of praise for um, something that Professor uh, Espinoza recently wrote about Shakespeare saying that in some ways, uh, it's not so much that we need Shakespeare, but he needs us. And that, that's mm -hmm. one thing that I love about uh, everybody on this panel is the way that they're they're thinking about our, our conversations and what we can bring to Shakespeare today in the uh, in this new millennium. Um, as, a, as a scholar, I've been reading a lot of great work on Shakespeare over the past decade, both his intellectual formation as well as the, the kinds of collaborative work, the deeply collaborative work that characterized his theater and his playmaking in the late 16th and early 17th century. So as, as I've been reading this work over the past decade, I've, I've also been watching my own children progress through their education at various stages of schooling and um, found them and found myself both encouraged and frustrated by some of the reforms that I've seen that have developed over the last couple of decades of, of, uh, of education. So uh, increasingly, I find myself trying to align or synthesize what I knew about Shakespeare's intel intellectual formation and his own education and his own ongoing development and what I saw in my, in my own children's education and, and trying to find ways to refine or clarify exactly what I found frustrating about their education and what I loved about the kind of education that Shakespeare might have experienced. Um, not obviously uh, the oppressive things about it that we don't want to sustain or recover, but some of the wonderful creative things about that education that I, I find still very powerful to this day. Uh, so my book, How to Think Like Shakespeare, is, is not really about thinking just like Shakespeare, but rather reconsidering the habits of mind that led him and a whole generation of creators to be able to do the great writing that they did in, in a very complex cultural environment, and then asking how we might recuperate or sustain some of those intellectual practices and educational habits of mind for us today. Um, ultimately, I, I turn to the conceit of craft or the idea of Shakespeare as a maker and Shakespeare's contemporaries as makers of words and makers of wonderful fictive uh, creations as, as the kind of thing that seems to me to be both uh, enabling for contemporary readers. It, it allows us to look at those creators at, not as monumental figures, but rather as human beings who were involved in a, in a, in a wonderfully um, dynamic cultural environment. And then also I think thinking through Shakespearean, Shakespearean creation as craft oriented allows us to see ourselves as makers and ourselves as remakers of Shakespeare. And that seems to me very much in the spirit of the liberal arts and what Phi Beta Kappa has always championed as um, sustaining the best of the past and in a, with a future oriented perspective about how we can revivify the past and, and draw it into conversation with the present as we create our future. Thank you so much, Dr. Newstock. I think we'll go ahead and uh, let uh, 
Dr. Thompson take it from here. I'm still hoping that we will have a chance to have uh, Ruben Espinosa back with us shortly, but I think we'll, we'll continue on now and let you have your reflections. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks uh, to everyone at Phi Beta Kappa for inviting me. Um, thanks uh, in particular to Scott Newstock, who invited me to be um, a visiting Phi Beta Kappa scholar all those years ago. Um, I guess I should start by saying that I'm not trained as a Shakespearean. Um, I was trained in post-colonial scho scholarship and African-American studies. Um, and so the set of questions that I bring to Shakespeare at the time when I was um, an early career scholar were slightly different because I was literally outside the field. Um, so I was interested in the history of racial formation and it dawned on me that the post-colonial literature that I had been studying, uh, racial formations were already set and that you had to go slightly backwards in time um, to figure that out. And stage seemed to be particularly important in the way that race got embodied in a way or um, faked, uh, faked embodiment as well. Um, but then my thinking uh, after doing that kind of initial historicist work changed a bit because I became interested in the place that Shakespeare has in contemporary racial formations, um, both in the way that we use him in popular culture for shorthand for a number of things, um, some of which um, Professor Espinosa highlighted about whiteness. Um, but also in the way that Shakespeare is actually just staged on contemporary stages. And so that led me to think a lot about um, the history of inclusive casting and the role that Shakespeare's plays um, figure in that, um, both on thinking in terms of production and also in terms of reception, so the audience side. This has um, landed me unexpectedly in very practical terrain and that I'm working for theater companies now. Um, at first, I was just consulting um, when there were problems with race primarily. And now I'm actually um, dramaturging and working behind the scenes, although dramaturg's probably not the right word because I'm involved in casting decisions and um, involved in um, thinking through the way that race, gender, ability, class, accent, um, impact what is put on stage and who is part of you know who's included in um in our world that we're trying to make so this has been uh, uh you know I've, I've kind of been working on the theoretical end and now to turn very very practically um is is challenging and amazing and makes me realize the kind of three-dimensional chess that is involved all the time um but it's 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 great because I always think that Shakespeare's the best vehicle to go over rough terrain. He's not the destination, but he's the best way to go over that rough terrain. And I think that's that's where uh, I'm I've landed um, quite happily. Um, so I think Professor Espinosa is back. So I will yield the rest of my time to him. Welcome back. Um, and uh, we, I, I'm sure that was pretty disruptive to your train of thought. I don't know. <laughs> you feel free to take up your comments wherever it makes sense to you. I, I don't know where I ended. I was actually, <laughs> as I put my script away, I, it was gone. So I don't know. I don't know where where I, I the, the the computer just shut me out at that point. So um, I'm happy to 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 move forward though into the Q to Q and A and 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 conversation. You know. If that's all right. Absolutely. Let's let's do that. And hopefully we'll provide some more chances for you to elaborate. I know there was a lot of interest and excitement and we heard, I think, much of what you were conveying was able to be um, broadcast before you were cut off. So um, let's let's go ahead and keep going. Um, I thought I would I think this is this is building on something that um, Professor Thompson just said, bring in um, an idea that I was seeing when I was looking through um, the recent book, Shakespeare in a Divided America by James Shapiro. 
And just as Ayana just said, um, Shakespeare is the best vehicle over rough terrain. I'm sort of interested in talking with you about how that rough terrain in each of your cases has operated to shed light on uh, what we've called in a shorthand way, grand challenges. But what Shapiro says, he says for well over two centuries, Americans of all stripes, conservatives and liberals alike, presidents and activists, writers and soldiers, have turned to Shakespeare's work to give voice to what could not readily or otherwise be said. And I guess I would, um, I'll let Professor Espinosa lead off um, and then I'll sort of go from there. We're gonna change our plan a bit around the order of speakers. Um, but I'm interested in hearing you talk about something in your experience as a scholar or a teacher or even a performer or a dramaturge um, in which you could see Shakespeare offering that way of giving voice to things that cannot otherwise be said, and maybe even helping build bridges um, across difference. So uh, I'll turn to you first, Ruben, as I said, and then we'll go from there. Sounds great, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is something that, you know, in, in, in considering the way that Shakespeare has been mobilized and utilized to kind of foster and, and promote an ethics of hospitality, for example, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it's easily available. And I think, you know, turning in a different direction, I, I've been more interested to see the moments of, of explicit racism in Shakespeare and bringing that to the table and having students really grapple with those particular ideas because for far too long, I, I, I you know, I, I, I very much <laughs> would embrace the idea of building bridges, right, uh, in this regard. But having taught at, you know, the U.S.-Mexico border, what, what we encountered were, were, were very visible walls, right, uh, a desire to ex exclude. And so in, in this regard, I think, I think, you know, his plays and uh, the period in which he's writing allows us to see you know, nascent formations of, of this kind of inhospitality, right? And so, you know, instead of, of, for example, focusing in a play like The Merchant of Venice, right, on on Shylock's hath not a Jew I speech and to say, this is a moment here, right, where, you know, he is, he is making a case for his humanity. I, I'm more interested to see Portia's, you know, real racism and, and really put that on the table and have students, you know, engage and think about those particular issues because it is in that play, you know, seemingly muted, right? It, it kind of falls out of conversations. And this is often the way that we think about, about racism in our present moment, you know? And so um, that's, that's one way I think of, of thinking about that. But I'd, I'd be curious to hear what, what, what others are doing. Why don't I ask Katie to chime in now? Um... And you can build on that, or you can take it into the context in which you've worked on, on the same kinds of things, things that can't be said or won't be said, and how Shakespeare brings us forward or to a new place. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm gonna slightly pivot on this question to talk less about turning to Shakespeare himself and more mm -hmm. about turning to Shakespeareans. Um, so yes, Shakespeare's plays are full of insights and sometimes, you know, quite prescient ideas about nature and exclusion and tyranny. Um, and brilliant Shakespeareans like Ayana and Scott and Rubin are helping us to see that. Um, but recently in my work as a teacher and researcher and director, I'm really inspired by the work of Shakespeare makers, to use Scott's phrase. Mm -hmm. um, like Lisa Volpe and Deborah Ann Bird are, are two that I'll talk about. So, so Lisa founded um, Los Angeles Women's Shakespeare Company in the 90s to perform all female Shakespeare before it was trendy. Um, and Deborah Ann, Deborah Ann Bird founded Harlem Shakespeare Festival in the early 2000s um, in her East Harlem community to give opportunities to actors of color who were and sometimes still are often denied them. Um, so this summer, I've been collaborating with a team of four undergraduate students, um, and they've been interviewing people who have worked with Lisa and Deborah Ann over the last few decades. And they're helping to document the legacies of them both um, for future archives and then for their own undergrad research projects. Um, and they're turning up extraordinary stuff about how, um, you know, playing a man has helped a woman negotiate her own gender um, or her own traumas from the past, um, or how, you know, Deborah Ann's work changed the way some of her neighbors thought about East Harlem. 
Um, so, so more and more, I find that collaborating with living Shakespeareans, with people like Lisa and Deborah Ann, with other actors and directors, um, and with my students as we co-create ecologically minded Shakespeare, that um, that working with and listening to these living people, um, that actually that's where I'm finding a lot of the unexpected and relevant insights. Thank you for those comments. I'm going to use makers to be a bridge to uh, Scott and sort of your your reflections on on these spaces where we can do things we didn't maybe expect using using what Shakespeare offers. Sure, I like I like that everyone has these I think related but um, but nice variations on somewhat similar metaphors here, whether that's Shakespeare as a vehicle or as a kind of form of hospitality or a host or a kind of maker space. Uh, I, I just, in general, I think that there's something about the kind of productive distance that Shakespeare offers to us versus, say, um, uh, reading a more contemporary author. I think sometimes it's hard for students to get beyond the immediacy of a of some contemporary authors because um, it, it it's hard to kind of find their again, that productive distance or, or a space away from that immediacy, though paradoxically, the distance actually allows them a, an inverted way to get back to the immediate in, in some of the ways that um, Ruben and, and Catherine are, are discussing here. So, you know, um, it, um, Shakespeare is almost like the kind of uh, computing sandbox where you're, you're allowed to play around a little bit, and then you, you surprisingly come up with really great things in that, in that maker space or whatever, whatever figure you want to use. So um, that's, something I've always enjoyed about teaching and reading and learning with and through Shakespeare. Um, and now it's time to ask um, Ayana for your comments on this. And, and uh, if you have further thoughts or if you wanna turn the conversation in a new direction, I, I think that would be also welcome. No, I mean, I think, um, I love I love this panel because I respect uh, these scholar teachers so much. Um, I think one thing that I would like to highlight, though, that I think uh, Jim Shapiro's book does quite well is that um, the stakes are high. Um, and so I can say I teach Shakespeare. My life is devoted to working on Shakespeare's plays. Uh, like I am not trying to cancel Shakespeare, but I've been targeted by the conservative media repeatedly for being mm -hmm. someone who's canceling Shakespeare because I suggested that his plays were used as part of an imperialistic tool in imperial Brit uh, India, which is a fact. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, sometimes the um, when we're in when we're talking about these ideas and these tensions in an academic and theoretical way, we can lose sight of the actual wall that Ruben is talking about or the conservative media that is trying to dox scholars. So I guess I do wanna say, or to get back to Katie's point, like our existence, like the existence of our planet is at stake. Like there are real life issues that are at stake. And so I think this is where the liberal arts is so powerful and why Shakespeare is such a great vehicle on that rough terrain is because the stakes are that high. Um, and um, we have the tools to be able to connect all of these disparate threads and Shakespeare allows us to do that quite, quite nicely. So, so, you know, I love what I do, but it's not without a cost. Thank you for that. I, I think this is a segue um, from that. And, and I, I guess I'm, I'm gonna go to your point about the liberal arts and expand on that and in, in thinking about the importance of the humanities um, in this country and in the world and in these ways of, of encountering the, the different challenges all that you've all articulated. And, you know, as uh, people on in this virtual room are well aware, Phi Beta Kappa has a long history of advocacy for both the arts and the humanities, helped found the National Endowment for the Humanities in 1965. And um, the, the legislation that was sort of idealistically crafted um, in a very different era of the US Congress than the one we're in now, um, states the humanities belong 
to all the people of the United States. Now we might amend that and make it broader, but this sort of sense of the humanities belong to all the people um, is an ideal um, that we might still hold up and think about. And I was just wondering um, how access to the humanities for everyone plays a role in what you do as a teacher and as a scholar. And maybe even specifically um, asking Katie to talk a little bit about UC Merced, the place that she teaches and how, what the work of, of being in an underserved part of the state, working with a largely first gen population, how that has kind of made you see untapped opportunities to share the humanities, widen the circle of people who see the humanities as belonging to them. Can you talk a little bit about that in your work? Sure. Yeah, so, so I've been at UC Merced for 10 years. Um, when I got there, I was an early modernist who was finishing a book on the 16th century. So it has completely changed me. You know, working in that context, um, I, I get emotional when I start thinking about it. You know, knowing knowing our students, um, getting to learn from them, and in, in a very and I'm very serious about that. You know, we always say we learn from our students. Like I'm very serious about um, the privilege of learning from them and collaborating with them. Um, you know, it 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 has reminded me of of those stakes. Like it's not like we're on fire. It's like no, we're literally on fire. Um, right, you know, my students are in danger of being deported, um, right? And um, so, yeah, it's, it's completely changed, you know, everything. Um, in, terms of, in terms of the humanities, in terms of Shakespeare, I think, um, you know, when, when, my, when my, you know, undocumented students, when, when my um, black female students, when my gender non-binary students say, um, you know, I'm going to make Shakespeare mine, right? I'm, I'm going to do this to him, right? Either because I'm inspired by it or because it makes me angry or maybe some combination of both, right? Like I want to, I want to do this better. Like Shakespeare didn't know this. He needs to know this. When they do that, I mean, it was like, I think it was, um, uh, Scott, who, who said, you know, sort of Shakespeare needs us, Shakespeare needs them, um, right? Like they're the ones who are, who are bringing Shakespeare into the, um, that conversation. And so um, when, they, when they do that and they make Shakespeare their own, I know that that is a political act, um, right? And, and an important one. Um, and I think that, you know, increasingly as an educator, I and mean, this is back to this idea of Shakespeare as a sort of toolbox or a renewable resource, like, um, as an educator, I'm increasingly just so much more interested in them leaving my class, realizing that they're more creative um, than they thought they were, or they can do something hard um, than them knowing a bunch of things about Shakespeare. Like I want them to learn about Shakespeare, but them coming away, learning something new, learning how to collaborate, um, you know, uh, feeling empowered in a new way, um, that's much more important. Um. Thank you so much for sharing that passion that you have um, and, and expressing that so beautifully. Um, I'm gonna just uh, go to you, Professor Thompson, because I wanted to ask you, I think it's in, in the same thread and also harkens back to what you said and others have said about performance and what Katie said about making Shakespeare your own. I, um, I know that you've been an advisor to the public theater in New York and I, um, as I read about the play, The Merry Wives of Windsor and the selection of it in the New York Times, I was so struck by the account of uh, the play and the process behind it after such a difficult year for the arts and for so many communities that it really became um, an opportunity to highlight joy and to the words of the New York Times critic were turn a comedy of exclusion into a celebration of difference. And you were quoted in the article and it was, I wonder if you would just share a little bit about that production and how joy comes into it as well. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's been such a privilege working on that production um, with Jim Shapiro as well, um, since we're both Shakespeare scholars in residence at the public. Um, we've, we talked a lot with the company, uh, the artistic company, 
behind the scenes people about what we needed after the summer of 2020 and after, well, after pandemic. <laughs> um, and it was agreed that we needed black joy, that we needed to represent black New York as having a world and a life that was to be celebrated and to be on stage. And um, I just thought Merry Wives is, is hilarious. And the jokes, the early modern jokes, which make no sense now, you can just rewrite. <laughs> and so that was the idea was, and so we, they brought in this amazing playwright, Jocelyn Bio to rewrite all the jokes, which are now truly hilarious and understandable. And, um, and it is a beautiful production. So if you're, if you're anywhere near Manhattan, you should definitely go see it. <laughs> Um, it's, it sounds amazing. Um, and thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I'm going to circle back for a minute to this theme of access to the humanities and people making Shakespeare their own in different ways. And, um, Professor Espinoza, I, I'm going to put it out there that you just recently joined Diana, um, and accepted an appointment to be part of the center at Arizona State. And, I read the press release uh, announcing it because it happened while we were in the middle of bringing you in to uh, help us with this panel. And um, she says, with the five black indigenous and people of color scholars joining our seven other early modernists, ASU will have the strongest Shakespeare program in the country. Um, and somehow we have two of them here with us um, and we're running out of time, but I just wanted to ask you what you're most looking forward to in this new community of scholars and how might your collective presence and scholarship and perspective amplify the power of the humanities going back to that, that idea. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, yeah, I'm, I will say I'm thrilled to be here and, and you know, I, I, I will not you know, pass up this opportunity to say that Ayana's vision has been amazing for the center. I think you know it was it it was the place to be before any of us got here, and so we're all thrilled to be here. I'm sure I can speak for for all the others as well. Um, I, I'm excited. I mean, I'm excited. I don't know where I trailed off in, in my in my paper, my reflection, but I you know I was gesturing at at the need I think for for black and brown praxis of solidarity, right? And that is where I've been you know focusing my energies and my research and really thinking about you know the. These systems of oppression that that you know work to marginalize various peoples, you know, there needs to be a concerted effort to 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 attack that and to really think about what it is that we are doing, you know, within our own work. And I think you know, Katie and Anna have, have spoken to this uh, brilliantly in terms of of, of what is possible. Uh, I, I am looking forward to that most of all. I mean, I, I am struck, you know, when when thinking about the stakes being high. I remember Peggy O'Brien at, at, at you know mm -hmm. Folger shortly after the insurrection on January 6th. You know she she said I, I, with real sadness she said I, I looked out at those people. She lives on Capitol Hill and said I, I can't you know I couldn't help but think like every single one of them had an English teacher. Like why why weren't they more compassionate? Why are they you know capable of doing this and. And, and that I think is the truth of the matter. I mean, the, the, the mobilization at the moment to exclude critical race studies, right? As if it had been a big facet of the education system at the high school level, which it isn't, right? Um, is, is, you know, it's an, very much a, 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 a deliberate attempt, right? To silence scholars of color and really to silence the attempts to, to address white supremacy. And, and here we are on August 3rd, you know, this, this for me is a, it's a very difficult day. This, you know, two years ago today, uh, you know, a, a young white man came to my hometown and, and killed 23 people in his own words to kill as many Mexicans as he could because he believed that there was an invasion, right? And this, this is not, you know, th this is coming directly from 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 Greg Abbott, you know, who, who had sent out a memo from at that point, the then president, right, who cast Mexicans as a threat. And so when thinking about these issues, I, I, I can't help, you know, but 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 commit myself right to to anti racist efforts and to make sure students are are aware of the monstrosity behind that. This, I think ASU gives us a platform for that. And also, I, I, you know, 
Ayana's mentioned it, our, our wonderful Dean Jeffrey Cohen mentions this quite a bit, but the charter at ASU is one about inclusion and not about exclusion. And I think that is critical. It's exciting that this is going to be, you know, the place to be when it comes to Shakespeare studies because it is a state institution and because of the charter of this institution. So I, I'm, I'm, I, I hope you can tell from my, <laughs> from my voice, I'm thrilled to be here. I'm very excited to see what, what, what happens moving forward. Thank you all so much for your passion and your brilliance and for sharing with us. I would love to continue this for much, much longer, but um, as advertised, we, we do have to wrap up. We have other sessions coming and for our audience, I think you have um, set us up beautifully for the panel to come next, uh, inclusive excellence, the key to the future. And Phi Beta Kappa is investing in that and you have really helped us start off our meeting with uh, so many insights and so many ways of continuing to contemplate these important, urgent questions. Thank you all so much.